Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back, and today I am joined by none other than 2014 WSOP main event champion, 10 for 10, Martin Jacobson. Hit the 10 with the 10s to win 10 million. We'll get into all of that and much more on this week's episode of Run It Back. We are watching the entire 2014 WSOP main event final table. If you like what you see, Please like the video, subscribe to the channel. I do this show twice a week with all the biggest stars in the game, re-watching some of the biggest moments they were a part of. So Martin, first and foremost, how have you been holding up? I mean, it's been a weird time for everyone, but I'm just uh, hoping that everything is okay over there. Yeah, pretty good, uh, all things considered. Uh, <laughs> definitely a weird time, but uh, you know, I'm lucky uh, to not have been affected too badly. Um, online poker has actually improved. Uh, obviously, usually around this time, I'll be in Vegas, uh, first summer at home in, in London. Uh, so that's a, that's a big difference. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a very different lifestyle for, for everyone uh, with the World Series of Poker not happening um, during the normal dates. So everyone is experiencing the summer at home for the first time in many, many years, depending on how long you've been in the game. All right, Martin, let's let's set the tone here for this episode. I'm going to run the intro to get those adrenaline juices flowing, and then we'll dive into your big final table, because obviously those intros, they always sort of they always sort of get us the hyped The final up. table of the World Series of Poker main event is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This year, nine poker players emerged from a field of 6,683. But for one member of this elite group, the opportunity is now twice in a lifetime. Going back to back gives me a chance to finish what I started last year. After a career full of ups and downs, Mark Newhouse finds himself in rarefied air. Back to back final tables with a legitimate shot at $10 million. It's a big number can buy a lot of freedom. I don't know what I'll do with it yet, but I'll figure out when I have that problem. Newhouse is not alone on this joyride. The Netherlands' Jorrit Van Hoof is the chip leader. This is a potentially once in a lifetime experience, of course, but I really try to focus on playing poker and not on the end result. Nine players, one bracelet, 10 million for first. It's the 2014 World Series of Poker main event. Final destination, top of the poker world. Welcome to the 2014 World Series of Poker main event final table telecast presented by Gentleman Jack. It's a marathon, a minefield, a massive sea of poker players. Now the final nine are in poker's promised land. Tonight, the business of awarding $10 million. No surprise to see huge crowds of supporters turn out for this final table. They've traveled from Brazil, Sweden, Norway, from all corners of the world. Hi, everyone. Lon McCarran with Norman Chad. Kara Scott will provide updates from the floor. Mr. November 9, Mark Newhouse is back for round two. All right, we're getting set to introduce the players here at the final table. Martin, when you see this, you know, what's the first thing that comes to mind? <laughs> like, it looks so old. It feels like such a long time ago. But at the same time, like you know, I remember everything like it was yesterday. Like I remember the interviews, like being up at the the Rio doing the zip line. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny. It's yes. funny looking back. So you mentioned to me that you have never watched the final table. So w first of all, why is that? Because this is your big moment. I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I actually like never really watch anything where I play. Uh, I probably should because you know you can learn a lot from it. But um, I don't know. I think it's just one of those things I don't like watching myself. Uh, <laughs> you know, I never watch any of my interviews. Of course, I'll watch this one, but uh, <laughs> uh, normally I don't. Um, and uh, it's I mean it's a long time, a lot of uh, um a lot of hours and I know what happens. So, it's <laughs> <laughs> but it would be fun, you know, especially now when it's been some time to go back and watch it and like to relive the moment and re, you know, re try to remember uh, some things. Cause when I think back at it, honestly, it's like mostly just a blur. Um, I was so focused on, on playing that I like didn't really absorb everything around it or, or anything like that so yeah looking back at it from from that regard it would be fun 
Yeah, so we are diving straight into the action. Obviously, you did not start out with the biggest stack. Jord van Hoof was the chip leader. Um, Mark Newhouse was the biggest storyline, having finished ninth the year before. Um, you had the second smallest stack, I believe, uh, coming into the final yeah. table. Um, take us back towards the moment where you made the November 9, and you sort of knew the, that the road ahead for you to be even, even become champion would be very difficult just because of the chip disadvantage. Yeah, I... I did, but uh, it wasn't something that I was that concerned about. Uh, I was just pretty um, accepting of the situation I was in and just felt fortunate, you know, to even make it because um, I started off the tournament, like even day one, I was the overall ship leader. Uh, so I had a really good start uh, straight off the bat. And then I, I actually didn't have a losing level till day five. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the sickest tournament I ever, ever played. It was just like everything worked, you know, uh, and just kept, you know, climbing up the, like staying on top of the ship counts, like almost all the way through. Uh, but then uh, later towards like day six, day seven, like I was still, you know, comfortable, but um, I lost some pots and like I wasn't in the top ship counts anymore. I was kind of in the middle. Um, but sometimes when that happens, it can be a bit of a mindfuck because you're so used to being, uh, you know, at the top of the ship count. So even when you slip just a little bit, it's uh, like tournament poker is weird like that. Um, at the same time, like when you're the super short stack and you double up and you have <laughs> close to average, you, you feel like a king. <laughs> so it's just kind of how it works. Um, but anyway, and then once we play the final table bubble, uh, I actually misclicked uh, a pretty crucial hand and ended up doubling up. Um, I think it was uh, Tonka. Uh, not Tonka. Uh, <laughs> Tonking. <laughs> uh, sorry, what's his name? William. Yeah, William uh, Tonking. Tonking, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I doubled him up uh, in a spot where like, he probably wouldn't have seen the flop you know, if I, if I would have raced, which I was intending to. Uh, but I learned free flop under the gun, which... You know, in hindsight, it wouldn't have been that bad of a play being a mid stack at, at playing the final table bubble where you want to reduce the variance as much as possible. Uh, but anyway, we went three way and he flopped the flush draw. And, uh, I think we both flopped the, I flopped the flush draw and he flopped two pair or something like that. And then we, yeah, it was unavoidable to get it in at that point. But uh, that ended up, uh, you know, costing me a lot of chips and uh, at that point I was uh, I think I was last yeah, or second last uh, so after a hand you know you start thinking like oh shit we're still 10 left like <laughs> is this gonna be it is this gonna be the you know the blow up um, so uh, I was just kind of happy to make the final table yeah that's funny because the way you described it, I think anyone who is watching right now will immediately recognize that emotion from playing tournaments. You know, you're sitting on 10 bigs the whole time, you double up and you feel like a, like a king. And you have, 100, yeah. you have 100 bigs, you drop to 50 and you feel like a complete loser and like you're almost out the door. Um, but yeah, that, that would make sense if you're a complete beginner, you're playing your first tournament, <laughs> you know, to have those emotions. But still today, like that's how I, <laughs> that's how I feel. Uh, it's weird. It's like a feeling that never goes away. But I think that's part of what's so special about tournaments you know that passion and that emotional roller coaster like it's almost addicting because you never know what's going to happen and you're going to have so many highs and lows throughout the tournament and uh if you manage you know to go all the way like it's such a incredible feeling to know that you've like been through all these obstacles the lows the highs and like finally come out on top beating the entire field uh, it's uh, yeah it's unbeatable so then the preparation obviously was a huge thing for you um you've re referred to it in various different interviews uh during that period of time where you basically said that you know you were going to be the best prepared you know both mentally and physically and pre preparation for the game itself and running sims and doing um doing whatever you can basically to get ready um summarize what that period of time was like between reaching the final table and and starting the play yeah exactly so since i knew that you know, like George just said, uh, this is most likely a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like it's, uh, it's probably not going to happen again. <laughs> like even if I play the main event every 
every year till the day I die. So I knew I wanted to give, make the best uh, out of the opportunity, of course. Uh, so as soon as I made the final table, like I started game planning and preparing and like thinking creatively of like ways to be as good prepared as possible uh, during this three or four months even, which is a incredible opportunity to, you know, use that time wisely and, and prepare. Uh, so that was never, you know, a question or a doubt that I, I wouldn't use that time uh, effectively. Um, so I started uh, brainstorming and mostly started talking with friends, uh, asking for their opinion and, and um, what they would do in my situation. And eventually I started a, a Skype group where I just added all my friends together and we, we uh, collectively started brainstorming. And then um, a friend of mine uh, managed to set up a, a home game uh, so we could play a simulation of the final table. So we essentially simul uh, simulated the stack uh, sizes and uh, I wrote player profiles on all the players. So that's another thing I did. I, I went through poker news and like any sort of news source I can find to just like go through all the hands they play, like what bet, bet sizes do they use? What tendencies do they have? What, what's their strengths? What their weaknesses? And then I, I put all that in a document and then whenever we played a simulation, so I was playing with my friends. So I had to invite them every time to play. Uh, so sometimes it took a while to to get a sim uh, sim going, but eventually we got there. And I sent out the document uh, the document to, um, to everyone. And then depending on their position, they would play a certain player. So that's the one thing we couldn't um, we couldn't prepare for, like who was going to end up where. Uh, so uh, everyone's playing different players all the time. Um, Obviously, I was playing myself, um, and uh, yeah, we, we played it out, you know, as a sitting go. But since it was online, it, it didn't take that long. You know, it took a, a few hours at most uh, because it's just so much more efficient than live. But we tried to set the blind level so it would uh, simulate uh, the actual final table. You know, as many hands per per level. So what were your biggest takeaways from that? Like, did you improve a lot as a player or was it more situational where you got a better understanding of this exact uh, moment? I think uh, confidence was key, you know, having, knowing that I've, I've done everything I, I possibly could and then I could just play um, very relaxed from a like, relaxed um, mental state. I didn't feel that much pressure at all because uh, I, I knew that like whatever happens happens uh, as, as long as I perform and I like I knew I'd done my preparation so I just felt very comfortable and also having all my friends you know like behind me and like you know great minds in poker that I've received coaching from and that supporting me and are backing me they're on the rail you know I felt like I had a, a pretty good advantage. So this final table, we've seen a few hands just now. Of course, it takes a while for you to really get involved. So we have a lot of time to talk now about all this sort of stuff until you- I actually started, now you say it, I started watching it. And then the first like two, three hours, I think I, I barely play a hand. I essentially blind down to seven big blinds. Um, Oh, sorry. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, I don't know there yet, but. but the coolest hand that we just missed, we didn't really talk about it, was Jord van Hoof uh, turning two pair into a bluff uh, with, okay. King, with King 10 against the um, straight that Larabi made. Um, the situation at hand, as far as this final table goes, was very interesting too because of Jord's big stack and him being quite far removed from you across the table mm -hmm. and you know all the stacks around you sort of creating opportunities but at the end of the day you basically needed a double up or you know at least some more room to play uh, in some kind of way before you could do anything so as you're sitting here going through those first hours blinding down did you ever lose confidence or was it just you know i'm just waiting for the cards and and it doesn't really matter what happens yeah it was the latter actually i know it sounds weird but you would start getting doubts like, oh God, I'm, I'm last in chips, but I really have, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I didn't have any doubts, but like, I didn't have any, I didn't feel any pressure of any, any sort. Like I was just adapting to the situation. Like, okay, now I have 
15 big blinds. I started with 32, I think. And now I have 10 big blinds and now I have seven big blinds. And I was just like so focused on, you know, playing my best and like, that's all that matters. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've played tournaments after that where I, yeah, I definitely felt those things where I guess I haven't been as prepared once you, especially once you've had a big stack and then you lose and then you've had a few like ninth or eighth place finishes before. And then you think to yourself like, oh, here we go again. And uh, yeah, what do you know? That, that's usually what happens. So I don't know if there's a, a correlation there, but no, I didn't have any doubt at the time. Well, someone who also had no doubts was Mark Newhouse, who was playing fearless um, after finishing ninth the year before. Um, this is an interesting hand too, him against Tonking with the tens against Queens. Let's turn up the volume a little bit. King checks once more. Newhouse now. All in. All in. Mark Newhouse moves all in on a bluff. Wow. This is for almost all of Will Tonking's chips. But if he calls here, Newhouse is out in ninth place again. That call. Talking oh. makes the call, and he sees he's got Newhouse beat and pushes Newhouse out the door. It's not possible, is it? Oh, my. He's not Mr. November 9. He's Mr. November 9th. A very stunned crowd here watches as Mark Newhouse makes his exit again from this main event final table in ninth place. Second straight year, he waits four months and gets no additional money. It was devastating last year. What is it? I mean, this was, of course, an iconic moment that most people will remember from this final table. Um, what was this like for you? Obviously, you get the pay jump, but also, were you, were you like, I don't know, astonished by how this played out and how Mark basically, you know, ended up busting, even though he had, you know, a lot of chips coming in? Yeah, this was probably the most uh, emotional I've been at the whole final table. Like, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, I wasn't thinking that much about the pay jump. I was... It was a mixed uh, mix of emotions. Like on one hand, I felt bad for for Mark, you know, getting ninth back to back, like that really sucks. Uh, but at the same time, like I I listened to his interviews before, and he said he didn't do any preparation. He was very cocky, saying that this was much softer final table than the year before, and <laughs> and you know, <laughs> kind of got what he deserved, and like he went for it, and I. Kudos, kudos to him, but yeah, it didn't work out. I just couldn't believe that Tonka call with uh, Queens because, you know, at, th at this point, like everyone's playing so, so tight that like you just don't expect anyone to bluff or to, uh, yeah, <laughs> very low uh, bluff frequency and uh, therefore the very tight calling ranges. Um, but yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's pretty surprising. Do, do you think the bluffs with the tens should have should have worked um, against? The, the range Tonking has, or is it just a bad bluff in general? Uh, I mean, I think <laughs> it's, a, you know, under the ICM circumstances, it's, it's a pretty poor bluff, but you mean, it depends how you, you look at it. You know, uh, I, I'm sure the U.S. thought that he could get into full pocket queens, uh, and that's why he went for it, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, to bust that, you know, before me, uh, like I come so short and uh, Bruno as well. Uh, I don't know what he had, but uh, pretty sure Newhouse was still like fourth or fifth in chips uh, at this point. So to bust before us, like uh, going out on a big bluff like that, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a fun. Yeah, exactly. Um, does it break the ice when someone gets eliminated? Does it change the vibe in the room a little bit when, yeah. when this happens? Definitely, yeah. I think you see that at every final table, but especially a big one like this, uh, where there's so much pressure. There's been a, a three-month break, uh, tons of people on the on the rail, um, so much anticipation and expectations and pressure. So yeah, once no one wants to be the first person out, right? Like me and you know, I was playing my cards, but I think. Uh, from what I saw, uh, Bruno played a lot, lot tighter than he did uh, prior to the final table. So I think that was just an adjustment he made because he flew down, I think, 300 Brazilians. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
so he had all like he had the biggest rail by far and the loudest rail. Uh, so I think he felt a lot of pressure of not coming, getting ninth. Um, like that was kind of his goal. So he was more concerned with that than, than to go for the win. Um, yeah. So once uh, Newhouse busted and, and, you know, a big stack busted too, like that's a, a big thing that everyone realizes, okay, like this is anyone's game, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's really. Th yeah, there he goes with the with the queen ten. Uh, Bruno has also been blinding down, all in for eight point one million here. Um, let's listen in. Ball blind. Felix Stevenson calls with pocket sevens. Well, at least he's got a flip. Flip. Brazil's first <laughs> main event final table is ever in a race for his main event life. Bruno <laughs> Politano ignited a very excitable country with his performance during the main event, trying to hang on here. Stevenson says he doesn't like to flip. He tries to look for better spots, but this was a pretty good spot here. Bruno's sister Zizi is more stressed than he is. Politano flipping for his main event life. Queen 10 against the sevens. Do six trade. No love there for Bruno. Stevenson poised for the knockout. The boisterous Brazilian rail, hoping to burst with joy for Bruno. Turn card is paint, but it's a king. No help to Politano. One more chance to pull it out of the fire. For her sake, I hope Bruno hits the river. The Brazilians from this Rio to Rio de Janeiro calling for a queen or a ten. The river is a nine of hearts. Bruno Politano, the second victim to fall at this final table. And there we lose Bruno in eighth place. That was pretty shortly after uh, Newhouse busted, if I recall correctly. Um, you're still sort of sitting there. You're not, you're not even part of the broadcast. Like, we see you in the background sort of hovering around. <laughs> Has not put a single chip into the pot uh, except for the blinds and annies. Um, speak a little bit about the rail and support you had during the final table because you have, you know, half the all-time money list on your rail uh, while Felix Stevenson has just Scott Seaver. You know, who's won a lot of money too, so, you know, let's be fair there. Um, everyone had their own rail, but you probably had the most notable rail as far as the support you had. Yeah, um, you know, I'm fortunate to get to know a lot of great players uh, along the years. Um, a lot of uh, it's my uh, close friends, so it wasn't hard to <laughs> hard to find a, um, a good group of support um, for uh, for the mission. Um, you know, a lot of them had uh, pieces as well, uh, small pieces, but a lot of them didn't, and they still flew out to Vegas just to, you know, support me. So that felt great. And then I decided quite early on that I wanted my immediate rail. So you see the people sitting just behind the table. Those seats were limited to, I think, 15, 20 people, at least that's we were starting out. Uh, and I knew straight away that, like, one of my biggest priorities was to not get emotional at any point. So I knew that I just wanted my friends and coaches there uh, and not my family. So I strategically uh, placed all my friends there and then put my family up in the nose plates. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, uh, that's funny. And yeah, I think it worked pretty well because I knew that I, if I were walking over to the rail, it, was, it wasn't too get emotional support it was just to get strategic advice because i was just jutting out all my emotions and that's why i didn't really think about the pay jumps or, or i mean i thought about the pay jumps but i didn't think of like okay what am i gonna buy with this next pay jump like i was just like looking at it as a game you know like laddering up and winning Right. Um, were you were, I'm, I'm assuming you were receiving information in real time because, of course, this was being broadcast live with a, with a delay. Um, how, how did you put the team together for that? And how, did you guys have a special way of communicating about that? Yeah, so, so uh, some of my friends couldn't make it uh, to Vegas. So they were just home watching the stream and then they were reporting to the guys that were live. Uh, and they got pretty good uh, report. I think it was uh, Timothy Adams. He was like the main guy. Um, he, uh, yeah, he gave a, gave a, like a really like thorough, uh, 
analysis on, of um, uh, of the broadcast. Uh, but then it was it wasn't as easy to actually use the the information that, that you're given. Like it's it's kind of hard to uh, to adjust to it and. Uh, <laughs> We see Dan Sindelar busting. Watching it too. Yeah. I got... <laughs> we'll turn it up a little yeah. bit for this uh, last bit. World Series cash and his first main event cash. It's worth over 1.2 million. Dan's family feels his pain, and the Von Holf supporters continue to live a charmed life. Your Von Holf well on his way to continuing some of the recent success. Than... So yeah, I mean, I I keep forgetting this is the first time you're seeing it as well, and this is an <laughs> elimination. We lost Dan Sindelar. Um, so yeah, you you had you had a good support system going, but obviously there's there's only so much you can do with that information because it's also very situational, right? Yeah, and you only get like th you know was twenty second and thirty second uh, commercial break. There wasn't any extensive breaks really for the first I think three or four hours, and then you know we had a fifteen minute break or uh, I think a dinner break, and then we just played on. Uh, no, I don't think we had a dinner break actually, but it was so catered to the ESPN broadcast because it was, it was live or it was on a 30 minute delay. So that's pretty much what they cared about the most, you know, catering to ESPN, which, you know, it's not great for, from a player point of view, but, uh, you know, it's great for the, the viewing. You know. The first, the first VPIP, right. the first voluntary chip put into the pot, queen three suited. Oh, this is blind versus uh, no, blind. I call. He does make the call. So the two short stacks squaring off. Pappas with about six and a half million. Jacobson with 15 and a half million. Was this the first time I was all in or the first time I did it, I got called? This is the first time you made the broadcast. So I did not go back. <laughs> I did not go back to see the reporting on like the first hand you played. Um, but this is the, the first one we, we were seeing here on this uh, on the show. So um, let's listen. Jacobson to take the lead. Pappas did flop a spade flush draw and a Broadway draw. What a flop. Yeah, Norman Pappas is actually favored right now. All right, turn card. Eight of diamonds brings a flush draw now to Jacobson, taking a couple of outs from Billy. Yeah, so now Pappas would need a spade or a non-diamond 10 or king to stick around. The river card is a non-diamond king. We'll keep Billy Pappas alive in this main event. So huge swing here. You had him covered. He would have been out if he um, lost that hand. He doubles up through you. Um, you oh, wait. I thought I was all in. No, no. He was all in. Oh, how did I get my chips in? I, I mean, you, 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 you hadn't blind down that much yet. Oh, yeah, right. So n now you're now you're down to nine million. This is when you get into the into the realm of the short stacks after doubling up Billy. Um, All right. So maybe you maybe you like won the blinds a few times uh, during this whole period where Newhouse, Politano, and Sindelar bust. Um, mm -hmm. But this was at the first marquee moment where you actually get short. Uh, Billy Pappas was the short stack before this yeah. hand. Um, so you mentioned just a little er earlier that Mark Newhouse claims that you know this final table was softer than the one before um but i've watched basically every ma main event final table and i'd be willing to say that th especially the three-handed battle was maybe the toughest i've ever seen as far as the talent at that moment in time because it's hard to compare eras but how do you look back on the skill level at this final table yeah i think it was a very very tough final table um papas you know was basically the only non-pro um he uh, I mean he still had like you know good experience. He was a solid player, uh, but he was uh, I think originally a football player, a football yeah. world champion. Yeah, he <laughs> was. That was pretty cool. Um the very um, yeah, very tough final table for you know such a soft soft tournament as <laughs> with seven thousand players and Five thousand uh, at least rec recreational players. You know, only one make the final table. Like I mean, that speaks truth of uh, uh, the skill uh, edges in poker, and especially when it's it's a very slow structure and lots of room to uh, uh, to utilize those edges. 
the most beautiful flop of all time. Three aces there for Billy Pappas, who uh, <laughs> basically locks up uh, another big win and another double up here in this situation. Um, the, the characters and the people at this final table, um, how much did you know them before and, and how much do you still stay in touch with them? Because clearly um, it's basically funny to see that you and I believe uh, Felix Stevenson and Yord had already had some history, right? Uh, no, I actually, I hadn't played with anyone except, um, Sindelar in some event. Oh, really? He oh. was, yeah, he was the only one I played with before. Uh, and then obviously I played with a few of the guys, um, going deep, you know, day five, day six, play with Jorit, uh, most of all, I think, um, uh, didn't really play with that much with uh, anyone else. Uh, so they were all kind of yeah, new to me and uh, you know, I had to do my research and try to get as much information as, as possible because I really didn't know exactly how they were going to play. Even the final table bubble didn't last too long, if I remember correctly. I think it lasted about an hour or two. And uh, not a lot of hands went down. And you know, People will play differently uh, on the final table bubble than they will after having three, four months to prepare <laughs> and God knows what they've been up to. So. But that's, that's interesting, though, that you didn't know them all that well, because in my memory, somehow I thought that you guys sort of had played on the tour or online. But no, I but then afterwards, uh, you know, you started seeing the guys more. Uh, so George was playing a lot after, and, or even, sorry, even uh, in the break between. That's when we played. So, yeah, so we did play. Uh, but it was after we made a final table, but it was before the final table. Oh, right. Like George played a lot. Uh, so we, we played a little bit together then. And uh, I, I knew straight away that he was going to be my toughest challenge. You know, I mean, the ship laid and being completely fearless, like very aggressive and a good, solid player. So uh, he was definitely the what I assume would be my biggest threat. All right, let's listen in. He needs runner, runner help. I think this might be ours. <laughs> Sorry? I think it today is really working out for you. <laughs> Antonio Larabe's day is growing seven. short. Turn card. Another eight net with the 22-year-old needed. And Donny Larabe in the books as the sixth place finisher. Well played. All right, we are down to five all of a sudden. And we're still relatively early in the broadcast uh, to already be down to five. Um, Larabe, accomplished Spanish pro. Haven't seen much of him since. I wonder if he, you know, if he's st probably still grinding online, but I, I don't really uh, know of many big live results from him yeah i haven't seen him either um you know i've seen jorik uh, felix was playing for a few years after i think he's sort of retired now uh Sindelar i've seen tonk uh tonk uh, william i've seen a few times Tapas i haven't seen uh, obviously he's not a, a professional but um yeah um bruno i've seen right so then, so then, um, what's it like playing with someone who's both good and the chip leader in the case of Yord? Because especially this first day, he was just completely dominant and, and controlling basically the entire table. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, it was uh, my, my toughest challenge for sure. Uh, but I was also fortunate that he was positioned on, you know, as far as <laughs> from me as possible. And uh, I was kind of lucky to have Papas and, and Bruno to my direct uh, left as well, which meant that I could, you know, steal their blinds a little bit easier because I knew they weren't going to play back at me. And they also couldn't really afford to because they didn't have a lot of chips. Uh, so that was uh, kind of lucky, I guess. Here's one of the biggest moments of the final table that really could have changed things. So let's listen in on this massive clash between Felix and Yorit. Micah Jackson knock out Stevenson. Von Holt can seemingly do nothing wrong tonight. Lucky us for having the AC. This is pretty good. Very lucky to have the AC. Stevenson's coach, Scott Seaver, thinks it's lucky to have the AC, and Scott's hardly ever wrong. There's the flop, and he's right! <laughs> Stevenson gets an ace on the flop and a chest massage, and he's about to double up to 44 million chips. So now it's Von Hoff looking to improve to keep his role going. 
Here is the turn card, no help to the Dutchman. Hitting his first speed bump at this final table. Three, three, three. We want three, three diamonds. Three, three diamonds will do. Well, anything but a jack will do for Felix. The river card. The seven of spades will work. All right, huge momentum shift here at the final table as Felix doubles through your through the chip leader. Um, and he, he now has, you know, a very strong stack to continue playing with. Obviously, you're always rooting for someone to bust when you're at a big final table like this. Um, Felix also one of the toughest players at the table and that, that really went that, that really went to show in the next couple of hours. Um, when you are an observer at the table, when you see something like this happen, do you care? Are you involved, you know, or, you know, invested emotionally at all in the outcome? Yeah, again, I would say normally I am, but in this case, I, I, I really try to not focus too much of the outcomes or things that I, I couldn't control. Uh, but it, it's really exciting to watch, you know, these big swings and like flipping for millions and, and dreams. You know, there's so much emotion in the air from everyone involved. So it's hard not to uh, enjoy it. Here you are with fives all in. All in technique. And Pappas, with virtually an identical stack, has a big hand here in the small blind. He has been playing his rush. All in. And he says all in. Stevenson has them both covered. He folds, so here we go. Both effectively all in, but Pappas does have a stack worth a measly 50K more than Jake. So we, I think on the broadcast, we missed some of you chipping up because you're all in here for uh, 24 million against uh, Billy Pappas, and you guys have very similar stacks. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, how you managed to get up there. Was there a double up that didn't show, or um, was it mostly just picking up some blinds? I don't think so. I think they they would show all the double-ups, but they probably cut out some of my rejabs because they it's not that all exciting. Uh, someone races, uh, I managed to find a good spot and, you know, pick up the pot uh, without a showdown. Uh, but uh, I think that happened 18 or 19 times. I was all in. Someone someone raced. I went all in and didn't get called. Wow, that's so a, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to uh, to win a lot of ships and uh, risk free as well. So obviously, I was very fortunate to find the right spots and to not get called. Uh, so you, all all it takes is someone wake up with a hand and a uh, tournament can be over. But when you play that way, like you take some risk, but uh, you, you know it's uh, you could always even if you do get called, you can always suck out or whatever or you <laughs> win a flip. Well, I mean, this this was the biggest slip of your life. If you lose, you're out, and Billy Pappas was down to less than one big blind. The fives, yeah. The fives, right. The fives is the biggest slip of your life, right? No, no, yeah. no doubt. Um, I also saw a lot of emotion, high-fiving, cheering with the crowd. Was that the first time you allowed yourself to, you know, feel anything? I think so, yeah. Uh, it's funny, yeah, you say that. Um, I noticed that as well. But uh, I think because I realized that, that oh, wow, well, this is a really big one, like, if I lose this, I'm out. If I win this, you know, I have a really good shot at, at winning the tournament. Like, we're down to five players or four players if, if I would have busted uh, Pampas or essentially busted. Like, uh, he covered me by, uh, you know, a ship or two. But, <laughs> but I knew it was a very, very, very important uh, flip to win. So, yeah, winning that one felt good. And now sort of the poker starts. With, with Billy Papa's busting, it's four-handed, it's game time. Uh, the stacks are much more even, of course, in this four-handed situation compared to uh, playing with nine players, and there's like short stacks all over the place. Yort still had a commanding chip lead at this point, um, but it changes the game because you get a lot more uh, chips to play with. So was there a lot of strategy talk with your rail at that point, or was it just you knew what the task at hand was and you were sort of ready for that moment? I kind of knew what what the task at hand was and how to how to adjust uh, a lot of things to these simulations that we had been playing right um a lot of the times when uh, my friends were couldn't play the entire final table we we just got them to start it and then chip dump their stacks to either me or to jordan or to felix or whoever and then we just continued playing so we, we did practice a lot of shorthanded uh play and uh, with different stack sizes, like where I had the big stack, where I was the short stack, where I was the middle stack, and just practicing, you know, ICM 
pressure. So you see, this is a really interesting spot. <laughs> yeah. So when you see this, explain to the audience why this spot is so interesting. Well, because Jordan has three three times the the amount of chips as essentially the the rest of us, and uh, we're all very even, uh, which makes it a, a dream spot for him because we all kind of like need to wait each other out, um, especially talking is. You know, 15, 15 million less than I do. So for me to bust for him is is, is a bit of a disaster. <laughs> and George's good to know, good enough to know this, of course, and I, he knows that I know this as well. So because of that, it can put a lot of pressure on me and, and Felix, who, who knows that as well. While Tonkin decides to just knit it up and, and try to, uh, you know, only play like really good hands, it could be a very frustrating spot as a middle stack in that scenario. Unless you get ace king suited, then life is a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah. But at, the, at, this point, poker. at this point of the final table, Jord has more chips than all you guys combined. So, you know, he's the runaway favorite yeah. and, and something big needs to happen in order for, you know, anyone to stop him. And during this first day, he was unstoppable. And as people are watching this right now, by the way, this is Run It Back. We are watching the 2014 main event final table, $10 million up top. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, do all that good stuff. Um, it really helps me with the show. And because we do the show twice a week, we would love the support. Um, in this situation, though, we are watching the main event final table that was played over two days. So you guys will see some wardrobe changes um, at some point when we get down to three-handed. And Jorrit puts on the sunglasses, which was a huge disaster, which, you know, he's mentioned many, many times. Um, but in this spot, it's you raising with the ace-king suited, pretty standard. Um, Felix defending there with the king-queen off. Um, because of stack sizes, I'm, I'm assuming that the, the call Felix makes is pretty standard. There's, no ever, there's n never really any uh, consideration for three-betting there. Uh, he could, but uh, I think given the stack sizes, um, he kind of want to play a more uh, uh, conservative strategy where, he, you know, there's not a lot of hands that he wants to three back call in there uh, because of that. So he'd rather play a strategy where he's calling the majority of his range and just playing position, like keeping the pot smaller. Because uh, like even even if he would have ace queen or whatever, and it would be a pretty standard like, three, but call spot in, in, uh, in a lot of scenarios. Like in this scenario it would be pretty, uh, not, not a, that exciting if you three bets and I go all in, you know, like right. what's my range? Like, am, am I doing that with ace jack or ace 10? Like probably like a flip at best. Uh, so because of that, you can have like a pretty strong calling range here. And you can also have a lot of traps because you know, George's behind, like, it's a pretty good squeeze spot for him. Uh, so it, let's say his range here is, is pretty tight. He's probably not calling worse than, than uh, Queen Jack suited. Um, so this is, like, pretty much bottom of his, of his calling range. So... You continue on the flop, uh, pretty standard. Uh, him calling their imposition, you know, doesn't seem too strange either. Um, you then give up on the river, obviously, but... The way this hand's played out, would you say this is sort of the, a, a standard way this hand goes given the run out? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know, I'm pretty good hand to to, uh, to call it. There's a lot of missed draws, uh, double flush draws on on the turn. Um, actually, I take that back. I don't, I don't think Felix bottom of Felix's uh, calling range here is, is Queen Jack suited. I think he's uh, a little bit wider than that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think this is one of the, the key hands. Uh, it's one hand that some of my friends uh, disagree with, and some it was like 50 50 in the camp. You know, uh -huh. half of my friends thought, thought it was uh, a good call, and like the rest of the half didn't like it. Uh, but I think it could go either way. I think it's, uh, it's a call sometimes, but you can pull it as well. So looking back on it now, seeing it now with with what you've learned since then, it doesn't it doesn't sway you in one direction either. You're still sort of in the middle there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can you replay the hand yeah, <laughs> real quick? Let, let, I just want to see the stacks, uh, the bet size is there. For sure. You want to go back to the flop? Yeah, just a flop action. Yeah. All right. Let's see. So you bet two million into into in six into six. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he calls, and then I bet five on that. You can fast forward a little bit. Yeah. You bet five on the turn. Yeah. Um, 
No, I'm not crazy about my flop bet, to be honest. It should be a pretty good board for for imposition, especially his range. Um, I would Today, I would just check a uh, majority of my range here on the flop. Expect him to bet, uh, you know, what I bet. So doesn't change things too much. And, but then probably would have checked all the churn. You know, if he bets again, I don't know. Turn is, is pretty, pretty gross. Uh, you know, you check and, and he bets 70, 80% pot or, or, or even bigger. Um, there's still a lot of draws, but I think at that point, I don't think his king of clubs have, has enough equity uh, to continue. So I think I would have just pitched it then. So but yeah, good, given my line of like bet, bet, like I didn't put it, I didn't, there's not a lot of queens he can have, right? There's two queens on the board. I don't think he's value betting a 10. I think he would have three bet jacks uh, plus. So there's a lot of, uh, yeah, ASEC suited and uh, uh, King Jack, uh, um, King Jack of Hearts, King Jack of uh, Spades. Uh, so yeah, a lot of a lot of Miss Ross and uh, even like I don't know if he's calling if he's flying that pre, but like Queen Nine suited. Uh, sorry, uh, Jack Nine suited. Right. So then, when you when you lose a big pot like this in this spot, where obviously Tonking was shorter than uh, you guys, does your rail have an opinion right away, or is everyone very much focused on next hand? You know, no discussions at all about the play. Yeah, no discussions at all. I uh, I was not even sure we had a break in between, so I think action just continues. That's the thing. There's not a lot. There's no timeouts. You can't just say, okay, yeah, uh, let's, let's take a break. It's you know, you lose a big pot like that, and it's so important to to not get emotionally uh, invested in in uh, the past and just be able to move on and play every spot, you know, individually. All right, let's listen in on this one. Talking with the worst of it. Jacobson likes it. Talking doesn't. And talking is crushed. <laughs> And here is the flop, four, five, jack all clubs. So the flame burns a little brighter for Will picking up the flush draw. Well, Jacobson seems to be enjoying the sweat, but if he loses this one, he's just about done. Team Tonking calling for something helpful. Turn card, not a club, but Tonking adds a straight draw to his arsenal of outs. Tonking now with 14 outs to survive here. The New Jersey resident now needs any club, a deuce, or a tray to survive. The river card. The queen of spades. Jacobson fades all the danger, delivering the knockout blow. Will Tonkin comes up just short, out in fourth place. All right, and then it helps to wake up with tens when uh, someone else has deuces. It's part, it's part of the journey, right? Like when you, when you want to win a main event, those hands have to fall into your favor. Uh, but now we're down to three-handed, which in my opinion is one of the most interesting three-handeds we've seen along with the um, Merson, Jesse Sylvia, uh, Balsiger three-handed, which probably was the longest one we've ever seen. But this one was also pretty intense. Uh, did, pl did play stop immediately when this happened? It did, yes. Uh so I was a bit pissed, to be honest, because <laughs> the day before, uh, Jack Eiffel, the tournament director, he told us that we were going to play till five in the morning, no matter what. What? Yeah. Yeah. And everyone, everyone was, was freaking out. And I go, we're going to start playing at, at four, I think, in the afternoon. And we're going to play till five in the morning. Like, that's like inhumane. Like, we can't do this. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, ESPN rules. That's what's going to happen. Uh, so everyone was really upset about it, and we had a big discussion. But uh, anyway, that's just, you know, final position on, on his behalf. And then this happens, and it's I think it's it's not more than 2 in the morning. And uh, we get down to um, to 3, and, and uh, Jack comes in straight away, and it's like, okay, that's it. That's a wrap. And, you know, I just had my last, you know, half mug of coffee, and <laughs> I was ready to go for another... 
because I, I was keeping track of the time all the time. I knew, okay, we're going to play till five no matter what. And yeah, you know, what can you do at that point? But it was just, it was a bit annoying to, um, to mentally prepare to play till a certain time. And then that changes, uh, for no apparent reason. Right. Um, but I think ESPN was worried that, uh, obviously, I don't know how they didn't think of this before, but they were worried that, okay, we're down to three already. What if, you know, two guys bust and we don't have any coverage for the next day? Like what if, what if that happens? Two players bust in the same half. Right. Uh, this hand, pretty big as well. Uh, you wake up with aces at the you know, towards the start of the second day of play. Stevenson has the king jack. Uh, once again, similar sort of scenario. He calls again on the flop as a, as a float uh, in position. And then um, this time he hits his king while you're still ahead. So give me your, back, uh, give me your thoughts on this hand. Uh, God, I'm so bad at like talking and, and watching the action uh, at the same time. What, wait, what wait. happened on the flop? Let's go back. Let, let's, let's, I let's, see my... You bet, okay. you bet four... I right, bet 30... Yeah, 33rd again. He floats, yeah. And this is a small blind, small blind, big blind for those who are... Oh, okay, you got you. Yeah, that makes sense. And pre-flop, I raised? Yeah, you raised, he called. Okay. Stevenson hits the card he wants, and it's going to cost him. Time. 10 million this time from the Swede. Back to you, Norway. <laughs> Well, if Jacobson had checked here, there was a chance Stevenson was betting any card on the turn. He could raise here, but I think he'll opt for pot control as I instructed him during our training. So this might be a, you know, a strange side street question, but does that hand with ace-king against king-queen play into the line you take here that you just want to you know, keep, keep the same sort of routine going even though it's an extremely small sample? Oh, I think you froze minds right now sorry as you're, this hand is going down your, your camera froze for a second i missed some of your analysis so what were you saying okay um i was saying that that hand is is definitely fresh in both of our minds right now as this hand is going down even though well this is the second day right yeah second day okay yeah so there's been you know a night in between but but still a very similar spot right uh 10 eye board 10 dry flop, uh, over card on the turn, and um, yeah, so it's it's definitely uh, on the forefront of our minds, and uh, now it's just like a, a leveling thing, like, okay, well, I, uh, you know, I was barreling twice with Ace-King before, uh, and then check call the river, like, what line do I take here? And like, does Felix expect me to take a similar line with a similar hand category and bluff now, or, you know, does he expect me to play tighter and, and choose a different strategy? Yeah. And in this, in this situation, you, you barreled the river. He thinks for quite a while and he makes the call putting you second in chips pretty close to your So, you know, really a big uh, game changer here. Um, but you must have considered checking to him there as well. Like quite a lot of the time. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty great. <laughs> That's a pretty greedy bet on the river there. Uh, <laughs> I kind of feel bad for him because he has like the one hand that he kind of has to call with, especially to that size thing. But like he's never expecting me to be bluffing at the same time. And I'd say he probably doesn't expect me to have a super strong hand. Uh, I kind of like a, I like a shove in his spot, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to pull up. And that's kind of what you can get away with. Uh, final table of this nature when there's so much pressure and, and uh, money on the line um, people are much much less likely to pull up big bluffs and, and gotta play much more honest because no one everyone's more concerned about screwing up except like me was maybe <laughs> like there's a few exceptions uh, we saw it with uh, um, the guy who won uh, two years after me uh the Vietnamese guy. Oh, uh, Kui Win. Yeah, Kui Win. Uh, that was one one of the most enjoy most enjoyable final tables, I think, because he went for it. You know, he was not a pro, and he, you know, he had nothing to lose, and but he was like putting it in the pro space, and then, like eventually won the tournament. So, I think if you're managed, if you've managed to 
uh, ignore everything that's at stake and just have fun and just like play I mean, like a quite an exploitable strategy or like putting more pressure than maybe uh, it's warranted, then you can get away with murder at a, at a stage like this. Yeah, it's kind of funny, right? It's, it's almost like you can handcuff the most prepared and the most skilled players by basically turning up, turning up the notch a lot as far as the variance goes because you and Yorit and Felix aren't looking to just play for stacks, you know, uh, knowing all the stuff that you've put into this. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, looking back, like the best thing like pa a player like Papas and Bruno could have done would just to be like, you know, play like crazy and like really going for it and playing more aggressively. Uh, it's kind of a dream scenario to play versus someone with less experience and uh, that's playing a, a tighter, more conservative. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot easier uh, to figure out those type of patterns and and be able to exploit them and it, rather than the opposite someone who uh, you know has a, an appropriate amount of bluffs every now and then completely unexpected but also have, uh, a reasonable amount of value hands so you're just trying to figure out which which one it is but it's really hard to pull off but there's some great examples out there of guys that are really had a lot, a lot of success uh, with that strategy that aren't professionals Right. So for myself and 99% of the people watching, if, if we, and I'm talking to the audience, ever make the main event final table, we're just going to go swinging. We're just going to go gunslinger style <laughs> trying to make something happen because that's probably... I mean, it's risky, but, but it can pay off big time. Uh, yeah. It depends. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk about Yord here for a second. Um, the first day, total control, bulldozing the whole table. Second day, he puts on the sunglasses. What I want to ask of you, did the sunglasses make him less intimidating or at your level, does it have no effect whatsoever? No, I remember it was a big thing. Uh, I was just thinking like, oh, wow, he, he's really lost it. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> to me... Uh, I used to wear sunglasses. I started out playing, uh, you know, the first year or two, but it was like kind of what everyone did back then. But this was in 2008, 2009. Nowadays, uh, you don't really see sunglasses, especially with from professional players. Um, and Jory, I felt was the guy, like we spoke a little bit before the final table, like I asked him about his preparation. And I, I told him briefly about mine and like, what supplements are you on? Like <laughs> that sort of stuff. So I knew it was very strong mentally as well. And that's, you know, intimidating uh, factor as well at, at the poker table. Cause it's so much about your table presence. Like uh, you're able to really be in the moment and read the situation well and like read your opponents and, and that sort of stuff. So when he put on the sunglasses, I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, why is he doing this, first of all? Uh, so he, he kind of sends a message to like, okay, this is too intimidating for me. Like, we're playing, you know, three-handed. Like, I don't want Martin to get a read on me. Like, you look at Felix. Like, he's, he's not even looking at his opponents. Like, I was looking at these guys, like, constantly, like, trying to pick up something um, while, like, not being too worried about giving anything away. And that sort of gives you a psychological advantage. Because when you, when you start getting in like a swingy mindset of like losing a little bit of confidence, it's, it's a pretty slippery slope. Uh, it can go, uh, it can uh, backfire pretty hard uh, when you try to cover things up. So it's, I was just like, obviously I was very nervous uh, on the situation as well. Like being on this big stage, having millions of people watching all this pressure being the most decent pro, whatever. Um, but uh, I was just trying to embrace all that and like using it to my advantage. And yeah, just, you know, prepare myself as much as possible and then play, perform my best and then whatever happens, happens. Right. Interesting thing uh, as well from me covering 
events for many, many years is that, you know, when I always saw you on the European Poker Tour and other events, in my mind, it was always like, oh, yeah, Martin, he's the guy who has been close so many times without getting a big win. And, you know, I, I don't have it in front of me right now. I, I could have looked this up, but I believe you had, you know, multiple top three finishes at EPTs without wins or top four finishes. Um, and it made me curious um, whether or not it played into, you know, perhaps, you know, a small thing in your mind of like, oh, now I'm here. I'm on the cusp. Don't let, let me not finish third or second again. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> but uh, everything happened so fast. And I was so, it was more something I thought of like leading up to the final table. But like once I was actually there, I just was in such a good like game flow. And then uh, not to spoil anything, but once we get heads up, you know, I had a pretty good chip advantage. Right. So, uh, you know, when you have the ship advantage, then, you know, you can't bust, like, at least not the next time. And, um, but yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I never, I never won a major tournament before. Like, the biggest I would have won was like a, a side event, like a 2K side event on the EPT or something. Right. Uh, and I remember that feeling, like, how much, and I also got second in the EPT for, you know, half a million, but, the feeling of winning a small a small side event was so much better than coming second, at least the second time. But that's also just like a mind game. You know, the first time you get I got third in the tournament, like I felt like I won the main event. You know, like it didn't matter. Like I made a final table. Like I even finished with the money. And then you kind of get used to that, and you expect more and more and more. So when you get second and second and second and get close so many times, a lot of times I have a ship lead. I was losing to the amateurs heads up. I a guy, like a French guy with a plastic rat, and he was like putting in my face. And we were playing heads up for uh, like 300,000 euros or something. And like the title, like all I cared about was the title at this point. And he was just doing this to me. And like he completely like threw me off the game. I didn't play great. And I played too aggressive. And uh, yeah, so obviously that was running at the back of my head, but. At the same time, I think I approached this final table a little bit differently, uh, where I actually managed to shut off my emotions and just focus on on the task at hand and just perform playing at every hand, uh, one hand at a time and just doing my best. Right. Yeah, so I just pulled up your hand and mob just to verify all these details. Um, you have four first place finishes, this being one of them. And indeed, the only ones before that were small side events uh, in, uh, in Ireland, UK and Austria. Um, but then you have... Uh, two runner-up finishes on the EPT, a third place and a fourth place. Um, so, you know, those are all enormous events. I mean, especially moment in time, uh, 2008, 2010, 11, and another one in 2011. So, you know, those are also game changers if you win them and your life might play out completely differently if you win, you know, a much bigger amount than you did. All those, all those payouts combined um, would have been very, very different if you just won one of them. Um, to, to get back to the action here for just a second, uh, we just saw Stevenson double through Jord van Hoof with 9-8 against Jack-5. Uh, Stevenson shoved with um, not even top pair, second pair on the river, and Jord called him off with uh, one, of the, one of the smaller pairs on the board. Um, was that a big momentum shift when Jord doubled up uh, Felix? Did you sense that you know, it was basically your event to win there, combining the confidence and the, and the stack sizes and the position you had on him? When Jord doubled up uh, Felix? Yeah, because that was the first time he really got a big dent in his stack. And, you know, yeah. he seemed to be squeezed in the middle between you guys after that. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot more even playing field at that point. Uh, but I was still pretty confident that like, me and George was, were going to end up heads up somehow. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, at this point, a lot of the pressure is off right now because I'm, I'm three-handed with what I consider would be the, my toughest competition even though it was a very tough final table altogether like these were the guys like we were like sort of meant to get three-handed and, and and play this out and uh yeah at this point it's like yeah whatever happens happens you know i'm just gonna play my best and and hope hopefully that that's enough can get the the cards on my side and 
win this thing. One of the things uh, shown in the broadcast was that uh, no player from uh, Norway, Sweden, or the Netherlands had ever won the main event. Um, the fact that you guys all three are, you know, from the same, I, I want to call it region in Europe for the American viewers because it's pretty, it's close enough. Scandinavia and the Netherlands uh, do closely associate. Um, was it anything special for you guys all to be European? You guys, you know, known for aggressive play for the most part, and you also seem sort of similar in many regards. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit uh, special, I would say, was, uh, I think, uh, yeah, since we're all kind of from the same, <laughs> um, same region, it, it didn't feel as foreign, you know, you're, we're all in Vegas, like on the other side of the, the world, different time zone, all of that, uh, far away from home. And here we are sitting playing for, you know, a world title in poker for a very first time, live streamed all over the world for ten million dollars. Uh, it's kind of a surreal moment. So it felt good. Like even though I didn't know him that well, like we've been chatting a little bit, like we've been friendly, uh, and I think there was like a little bit of a connection there. Uh, and even after, I know we asked this before, but yeah, afterward we, uh, you know, became like pretty good friends, like all three of us, and we've been hanging out after. And, uh, actually, we had uh, brunch with Jared in Australia now a couple of months ago before this pandemic and stuff. We were just catching up. Like he doesn't play that much anymore, but yeah, it was good to to see him and and uh, see what he's been up to. So, does that mean that you pick up the tab every time? <laughs> we actually we didn't make a deal, but we did one deal, and that's uh, the the winner because <laughs> we were all living in London at the time. And uh, the, our deal was that the winner buys everyone dinner in London, <laughs> like when we're back. But uh, I haven't been too good with that promise because it actually hasn't happened yet. Oh, wow. And now uh, I think Felix moved back to Norway. I like, has a family and stuff. And Jorid's uh, moved back to, uh, to Holland. Uh, but I mean, hopefully... <laughs> at least i bought your lunch <laughs> i mean vegas might even might even be an easier place to meet up if you guys ever probably yeah all play the main event again um yeah your took the glasses off here in in your opinion was that a sign of strength weakness desperation how did you look at that <sighs> more desperation more like he can't make up his mind i think once you put him on you should just keep him on right um but uh yeah, you could. I could sense for sure that he was losing a little bit of his cool, uh, and you know, losing a lot of chips. Like he, this is the first time where he's actually like show, showing vulnerability, and it's not a good spot to show vulnerability. And like when you're three-handed, then you're forced to sort of play every hand almost, most of the hands at least, because uh, you know there's only three players at the table. Blinds are high. Uh, antis, antis are still in play and, and you're playing versus you know two other aggressive players uh so that just makes you know you have to you have to defend you have to play you have to play uh, hard and because otherwise it's gonna get run over right it's funny too because nobody at this final table was gifted the title sometimes when you watch the main event final table you see one guy just you know catching hand after hand you know flopping sets making flushes all that sort of stuff at this final table it really felt like you know you guys were in the office grinding because of the way it played out you know if your catches a flush against in the hand against felix or you know if somehow his pair was if, if hands were reversed in this spot this whole thing just you know goes so differently um but the one thing I want to say about that is the fact that you guys all approached it, you know, one hand at a time. There was no one really that was uh, swinging for it. Um, do, do you think that cautiousness played into the minds of, of all three of you guys? Yeah, I, I would think so. Um, you know, you're playing for such big stakes and you realize that they're so close now. It's only you and t two other players. Uh, yeah, at this point, you just um, you have to approach it at one hand at a time. You can't dwell on the past. You can't look in the future. You just got to, like, yeah, treat every hand individually. Uh, but at the same time, you know, stay in the game flow. So because game flow at this point is so important. Like, how is uh, – I was very cautious of looking out for ten, tendency shift this, shift this uh, – 
uh, where, you know, someone steps on the gas pedal and then, like ups the aggression all of a sudden and realize, okay, well, this is a huge like pay jump or whatever. Like now I'm, I'm guaranteed, I think it was 3 million, 5 million, 10 million roughly. So, you know, at this point, it's like, such a big discrepancy between first and second because they they had to do it because they guaranteed 10 million for first <laughs> so even though they didn't get enough runners like it wasn't their intention to have five million for her second like it's not a, a draft kings tournament <laughs> but they didn't have a choice at that point so it was super top heavy so then you can you know sure there's two million difference between third and, and fifth uh, or I think it was even less, like one and a half. I think it was like 3.5 or third. Uh, so then you can make the argument that it's actually worth, you know, going for it, trying to knock the other player out, uh, one other player out to get heads up with a, a ship advantage and try to win the whole thing. Yeah, it, it's fascinating because your main event win had 6,600 players. Um, last year, when Hossein Ensan won, had 8,500 players, and it was the same first prize. Um, your 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 first prize, 10 million dollars, was the was the first time since Jamie Gold that they hit eight or um, sorry, they hit uh, eight figures on the first prize. Um, as we watch this footage, and if if big hands come up, definitely you know pause me or, or I'll pause the action and we'll we'll dive deeper into it. Um, what I'm curious about, we already know, is you're going to win. Um, what was was winning as satisfying and and did it feel the way you expected it to win uh expected it to feel during all those months of preparation like was it was it the reward that you were hoping for uh i i honestly i didn't know what i was expecting because that was the one thing i didn't prepare for like how would it feel to win you know it was, <laughs> i was just focusing so much on the preparation for these last three four months uh, that when it was all over, uh, I mean, we can talk about it after. I'm sure we'll watch uh, like the interviews and stuff. But uh, it was such a like shift because like all of a sudden all that pressure just drops and like now you're supposed to be emotional and happy and you know you're supposed to you have so much expectation of like how you should react as winning the main event uh, that it's uh, always a bit uh, overwhelming. And I didn't really know how to handle that situation. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, you know, great feeling. And, and the, one of the best feelings were just seeing the emotions from all my friends and like, you know, that excitement and that, that really uh, fueled me. In this situation, Jord makes, you know, you guys, you guys both make top pair on the turn here. Um, Three-handed play, the swings are so big. Um, is, is queen three suited, you know, a, a monster hand in this spot or... Am I, as you know, just a recreational player, overvaluing a hand like that in a three-handed battle? Sure. Sorry, I'm, again, I'm, I wasn't watching the action. That's what I was talking, but I, I checked back the flop. Yeah, you checked back the flop. Okay. And yeah, I mean, uh, with this action, it, it is a monster for sure. Uh, not not in the sense that I want to race it and get it in or anything, but it's it's a very good bluff catcher. Yeah, there's two flush draws, tons of draws on the on the board. And uh, I'm not, I'm unblocking all of them. Like I don't have a diamond. I don't have any tens or sevens or clubs in my hand. Uh, I'm a pretty shitty kicker, but um, you know it's just a slam dunk call for after checking back the flop. Right. So in a, in, a, in a spot like this where you have a terrible kicker, but with a, with a strong pair, um, are you anticipating certain kind of river action as far as the decision that you want to make with it? Are you like, oh, you know, hopefully we can get the showdown or hopefully I can get value. Like, does that go through your mind? Uh, no, I'm just, you know, I know on the turn, uh, I have a pretty clear call. And then on the river, I'll revalue. Like, I can't predict what he's going to do. But, you know, if, it, if the turn is a... Uh, and uh, do so hard it's like and he bets like it's it's a no-brainer call now i have a little bit of a decision you know the flush got there um or one of the flush draws got there but there's also a lot of missed draws and uh, that he can have and so at this point i need to figure out okay what's the bottom of his value range so like what's the worst hand that he would value bet in the spot and which hands can't he have like given that we're three three-handed you know he wouldn't uh, he would have three bet most of the, the pairs pre-flop. Like he sh 
probably doesn't have pocket deuces. So like you can also rule out all of the sets. Yeah, and this was uh, sort of the first hand that Jord, like, you can see a smile on his face. It, it seems like a sense of relief. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's placed with himself. It's, it's interesting because as I was watching this live in the moment, all I was thinking was, oh, maybe now, you know, Jord's got it back. And I've known Jord for a very long time. I was thinking like this hand, maybe, you know, he's got some chips back, you know, he's, he's settling down a little bit, but... Clearly, we're going to keep watching. Um, that wasn't the case, or at least, you know, things didn't go his way. Um, but still a very interesting hand, um, which still goes to show, and it's easy to forget, that this final table could have gone either one of you guys' way. Um, it, if a few hands break differently, obviously. Uh, Jord here picks up the ace-five suited. Um, you know, we're getting into the nitty-gritty here, so let's pay a bit more attention to the to the hands. Um, raising here from uh, from the button to 3.6 million. Um how long how long was this battle three-handed or and, and heads up as far as hours do you remember uh i believe uh, we started around five and i think i won before 10 so it would have been four four or five hours wow. with, including breaks that's fast yeah that's pretty fast 9.2 and there is the re-raise the nine million but we did uh you know we did go for it uh, <laughs> If you watch the Greg Merson's final table, for example, when they played three handed, I think they played for nine hours or something. Right. But that was a lot of limping, a lot of pot controlling, you know, like we didn't do any of that. Like we all <laughs> <laughs> went into it like like we we made a deal or something, you know, that we just wanted to like flip for the win, not flip for the win, but you know, go for it. Was, and, uh, yeah, I think that shows. Was there any consideration because of the the payout structure to make a deal? By the way, Yord goes all in here. Let's listen in. Jacobson calls with a big race and a golden chance to knock off Von Hope. Boy, Jacobson called that so quickly. A matter of fact, is as if he knew he was ahead. A very chagrined Yord Von Hope now sees his main event championship hopes draining away. You know, Von Hof went from being an unstoppable machine who intimidated everyone to getting pushed around. The story of my teens to my 20s. <laughs> he has stayed in great spirits, but you can see the despair. Both pair their kicker, and that leaves Von Hof with few options to keep his seat. That flop all but closes the door on Von Hof's main event. He looks shell-shocked, Norman. All right, the turn card, Queen of Clubs, Jacobson. Now just one card from eliminating the former chip leader. Rivers and eight. No, eight. The Jacobson camp hoping for heads up. Von Hoef's got to have a five. The river card, another queen. Jacobson takes it. Von Hoef is gone. You play Dolphin. We'll see each other along the way. He was in charge of this final table in the early going, but the tide turned. Martin Jacobson with a knockout. Von Hof, the latest November Niner chip leader to come up short. Jacobson does the deeds. I think we'll get the Jord Van Hove interview right after this this uh, sort of break, which obviously we're not going to show the commercials because this is running back and all we care about is the action and what's happening at the table. There's the money, $10 million being brought out to the table to play heads up for the bracelet. And uh, up until that point, the second second biggest ever main event top prize and that beautiful uh, diamond bracelet. Um, let's see if Jord comes up here with the interview with Kara Scott. Five. Hold on. It was Martin Jacobson's quick call oh. with oh. Ace-10. He re-raised pre-flop and then knew he had to go with it if Von Hope committed his entire stack. Jacobson eliminated Von Hope, leaving Martin and Felix Stevenson heads up for 10 million bucks. Jacobson's play has been masterful. He was a short stack, much of this final table, down to seven big blinds at one point. He was all in a lot. And now he's got almost all the chips. Comes down to a Scandinavian. Oh, wow. No interview with Jord. He just like went out the back door. I guess he must, <laughs> have, been, must have been very disappointed. Um, one of the quotes you had, um, and you know, we're probably going to see some interesting hands. One of the quotes you had was that um, it was about winning and the, bra and the bracelet. You were not thinking about the money. Ex explain that because you're playing for so much. Mm, I think what I meant by that was that I wasn't thinking about the money. Right. Uh, the money wasn't the the goal. The, the goal wasn't to win ten million. Like it could have been, 
uh, one million or yeah, like five one thousand for first second. Like, that didn't really matter. It was more. I wanted to become a world champion. You know, I realized that this was once in a lifetime opportunity, and I just you know had to win. <laughs> Would do whatever I could to to make it possible, and. Uh, that's kind of like the mindset I had. That's why I like didn't really study the pay jumps too much. I was just, you know, playing playing to win basically, but not like rushing anything. But being very patient and, and picking my spots well, because uh, it's a fine balance. Like you want to play to win, but you also <laughs> want to screw up and 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 uh, make a reckless play and then try to justify it that you were playing to win. Right. You race here with Jack-10 on the button. Uh, Felix calls with sixes. Of course, six is very strong. Jack-10 as well, playing heads up. Uh, you flop a parry and you continue. He check calls. Um, you know, walk us through this. How deep were we here, dude? I missed the, the stacks. Let's see. Uh, let's see if the stack sizes were shown here. Oh, there it was. Oh, do it. They, oh, there we go. Okay, 56. So 56 million. The blinds were w maybe one, two million? I think so, yeah. It's World Series of Poker Europe main event champion and 18-year-old Annette Oberstadt a few years back. Yeah, four, so it must be one, two. Yeah. Um, yeah, walk us through this hand from both perspectives and uh, give us your thoughts. Um, yeah, obviously, standard open with Jack-10. Uh, I could implement the limping strategy, but I think versus someone as as, as good and, and solid as, as uh, Stevenson, I want to raise most of my hands. Um, this is actually interesting. Sorry to interrupt you, but he calls 2.4, which means you had 1.6 invested, which means that the blinds were 400K, 800K. That means your, your raise was bigger. Does, does that make sense? Oh, really? Yeah, but look, look, look here. He calls 2.4 million when you raise to 4 million. So oh, yeah, that's right. That means he had 1.6 invested. Okay. Oh, wow. So okay, that's a pretty big raise. Yeah. I was going to say, because if, if he had 56... At uh, at two million big blind, like you can make an argument for for getting it in free for sure. Good. So, what what's more likely, you you picking a big big size or the graphics being wrong? Mm. God, I, I don't remember. I think I think the graphics is right. Actually, I think I, I might have picked a bigger size because you know, like I said, Stevenson is a very uh, good talented player um, so there's not much uh, to gain from keeping the pot small right something like that and I felt like he'd been playing like a little bit more cautious uh, on the cautious side so far so I feel like maybe I could just you know with this double up of eliminating Jory I can like intimidate him a little bit more and like push the pace that's kind of been my style uh, throughout my career. Like when I have a big stack, like I have to aggression, you know, when I have a short stack, you know, I think that's a, a solid uh, uh, tournament strategy overall. I right. mean, it's not a rocket science, but. <laughs> uh, okay, so I bet four into eight? Yeah, four into eight. But how hot? Yeah. Okay. So what, what's your, let, let me just pause right here. What's your consideration here in a spot like this? It, it can be from your current perspective or if you remember from your perspective. Obviously, you have a really, really strong hand and you're trying to get as much value, but you're probably also thinking, I'm never going to get three streets of value. So how do you approach a situation like this? Right. So, well, I could, you know, the CBA is, is, uh, is pretty standard and mandatory, I would say, um, both with my hand and, and with the majority of my range. Uh, especially with, with my hand, you know, it's very vulnerable, like folding out, uh, you know, uh, like a, a queen six, a queen seven, like suited or something like it's, it's quite val uh, valuable. Uh, so I went with the big size for that reason. I also get value for like all his fives, fours, ace highs. Uh, worse tens. Uh, so there's lots of things to get value from it and to uh, protect from at the same time. Uh, he has a very standard call at sixes, you know, is uh, over pair to the two lowest cards on the board. Uh, he has a backdoor straight draw and, uh, or backdoor, uh, yeah, backdoor straight draw. And, you know, ton, ton of showdown value. So I think that to the, to the turn is pretty standard. On the turn, he can play some leads, you know, when the bottom pair um, 
bottom card pairs. Uh, it's pretty good for for his range. He'll have a lot more fours than I do. Like I, if I had a four, I wouldn't really bet it all the time, uh, and especially not for that big sizing. Uh, so it kind of favors his range. And also my range is still super wide because I'm C betting a majority on, on my opening range. Whereas his is, is quite condensed because he, you know, called my half pot size bet. So he could definitely lead this turn. Uh, I don't know if sixes is a hand that he wants to do it with. Uh, but yeah, it can go either way. And uh, from my point of view, I have a decision, just like you said, uh, I'm Probably not going to get three streams of value. Depends on the the river, I suppose. But once the the bottom card pairs on the the turn, since it's such a good card for for his range, uh, he's probably not going to expect me to go crazy. You know, like if it was a scary card, it could almost make a better argument for a scary card, and like uh, you know, an, an ace, or for example, ace or king. Uh, you can almost make, a, uh, make an argument for that being a better bluff card or a, a better, easier to get value from sixes than that third card because it's going to expect me to barrel um, those type of turns more often than before. And, and you, so check, either, you, 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 know, you check back quickly uh, on the broadcast, but was it a quick check back? Check back? Do you remember? Is, is, was that like a, were you taking a lot of time for your decisions in that moment and did it affect how you looked at things? Uh, I think I be, knowing my my playing style back then, I think I made a, a deliberate quick check back, kind of like I'm done with the hand, you know, because my like I said, my range is so wide at this point, and I knew I had a, a great bluff capture. I'm not getting value from from that much, and I'm still no, I wasn't positive that he would lead all, all his four, so like I'm still setting myself up for like getting check raised. So pretty bad turn for me overall so uh, i elected to go with the bluff catching option uh or value bet the river if he checks right so what what do you what do you hope you do now or do you do you remember on the king <laughs> oh uh i mean at, yeah at this point i would much rather he uh he checks uh because i expect him to value bet uh Always better tens, and he, uh, he's kings, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I would say ten is like the cost for his value betting range. And I don't know if I don't think he would value bet. Um, yeah, a five ever or or a weaker pair than a ten. Uh, so you know, chopping with all his tens. Uh, so pretty pretty easy call for me. Like he'll still have a lot of uh, missed. Uh, draws that he, he didn't check race because I, I picked the big sizing on the flop. So like six seven, obviously he's easy bluff eight six suited, uh, like all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, just call and hope for the best. And if he checked, I would have bet myself. Right, and now you have eighty percent of all the chips. Um, is there is there ever a moment when you are heads up where um, you have to be careful not to get too excited or almost complacent, where you're like, okay. 80% of the chips, you can see, you know, that he's on the ropes. Um, is that perhaps the hardest part, closing it out? Yeah, it is. If, if you allow it to be, uh, that's where your uh, the mental game plays such a huge part because you can never start thinking about like, oh, wow, I almost have this in the bag. <laughs> and that was just like my, my mentality. I was just like, I'm going to play this guy for, you know, two days if that's what it takes. Like, I, I didn't... I didn't start celebrating at any point, uh, not even when we were all in and like I could see the 10. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert again. Yeah. Uh, so he makes it uh, three and a half million here from the button with ace three. Um, you defend with uh, the king 10 offsuit calling an additional 1.9 from the big blind. King high, he calls for a million nine more. All right, here is the flop four, Jack eight. Both miss that flop, so ace high is still in the lead. Jacobson checks king high. Stevenson might want to stab at it here, as Antonio Esfandiari has taught us. There's seven and a half million in the middle. May as well go try to fetch it. Puts out four million towards those efforts. Jacobson says he'd love to open a health food, fast food business, or a health club that focuses on body and mind. That just sounds like an upscale brothel to me. 
Jacobson with King High makes that call. Well, so what are we looking at here, uh, this situation? Uh, yeah, I mean, pretty, pretty standard so far, I'd say. Uh, Felix, you know, my, my defense, uh, yeah, plays itself and, uh, uh, Jack A4, uh, Rainbow, Felix can either uh, check or bet, but I think he wants mostly bet. You know, he doesn't have a great hand. He just wants to end it right here. Um, I'll, I have a pretty clear continue, you know, with my king high and backdoor, uh, backdoor straight cross. And then you, you lead the turn. Always love seeing... You know, things that, you know, me as a recreational player wouldn't often consider because a, a move that's not, you know, necessarily the first go-to in your head when you're when you're playing heads up. Um, this lead, obviously, because you pick up a lot of equity. Um, what was it? Was it basically to anticipate that even if he if he shoves, you're totally fine with getting it in there? No, no, definitely not. Uh, wait, how deep are we at this point? So he has 40 million to start the hand. You have 160 million. Oh, okay. No, if he shoves, I, I reluctantly have to fold. I think. Okay, so basically, uh, it's it's a it's a full on bluff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But I also don't expect him to shove very often. You know, if he has a made hand, uh, if he has a made hand, and he's gonna want me to continue bluffing, right? And if he has a draw, like he's in position, so like he's gonna know what I gotta do. So it's just not a scenario where you see in position shoving very often, especially the way stack sizes are. Like this, not a lot of merit for him to be racing. I don't know, like for protection, but like my range can still be so wide at that point. Uh, so I would just rather you know keep my bluffs in and, and bluff cash to river. Right. Interesting. Interesting hand. That's a very interesting situation that um, I w I would not know what to do like it's it's one of those things where you have to be really ready and prepared and have a lot of experience as far as playing heads up to be in my to... position or in Felix's. in your position because oh. your, your, your hand gets so much stronger on the, on the turn that you know my inclination is like oh i want to see the river i want to check maybe he'll check back because his you know his his range is no you know, it's i don't it's tough for him to continue like i don't really know um yeah. how to approach that but by you flipping the script on him also, I guess with stack sizes in mind, that just makes it incredibly hard for him to do anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like even if he has bottom pair there, uh, or like a, a decent ace high, it's 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 pretty hard to continue uh, on that turn. Right. All right. Here goes Stevenson with the king nine off. Um, strong hand heads up as well. Peers down at king. It's funny. I just picked this up. You stared at him first before looking at your cards. Was that an was that a was that an active decision that you made? <laughs> yeah, it's a, again, it's just all trying to get a, a read and information, and probably a little bit like intimidating him, like like you're sitting here in your hoodie and sunglasses and hat, covering yourself up. I'm right here, like <laughs> I'm not afraid to to look at you. You're clearly afraid to look at me because otherwise you wouldn't be covering up like this. Yeah, that, that's a good point, actually. Uh, you flop a five here. Um, you know, heads, heads up play is fascinating, especially when it's for five million bucks. Um, in this situation, you know, once again, he continues. Um, is your, is your, your, your five is, is always strong enough to continue at least one street with, right? Yes, definitely. Um, not, not much else to do here than to call and see a turn. Right. Which is what happens. A call. Turn card now. Eight of spades. Stevenson now with a gut shot. How much does this change your outlook on the hand? My what? Sorry? Your your outlook on the hand. How much does the eight change that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, not a great, not a great uh, uh, turn for my hand, and okay for my range. Um, I shouldn't expect a lot of betting now from from Felix. Um, he has a pretty pretty good combo to do it with because you know I'm gonna have a lot of five x uh, seven um, ace highs that I'm, I'm calling the flop with, but can 
just can't continue on the turn with. So good, good barrel from him. Right. That's just fine with Felix Stevenson. And that's not really a hand or a spot where I want to be leading. Or I could be leading, but not with that hand range. Right, right, right. All right, we're we're getting into the into the home stretch here of this main event final table. Um, what's it like so far? Looking looking back at all this for the first time. Ah, it's been fun, man. <laughs> I've never made it this far in the in the broadcast. There you go. I mean, there's no better reason to watch anything uh, other than you winning the biggest event of the year back then. Yeah. Queen of Spades here on the button by Felix. Did you feel as though you had him? outclassed heads up did you feel like you were the better player as well in this format uh i don't know to be honest uh i knew he, he had a lot of heads up experience but i think he mostly played plo before us like he's a he's a very um, good plo player so i didn't know much about his no limit heads up game but uh i uh i definitely didn't underestimate him i uh, just assumed that you know, you would play, keep playing solidly and play every one hand at a time and, and you know, fight back. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Here he makes top pair, you make middle pair, obviously a lot stronger than the previous clash. And that's how Rupert Murdoch built his media. Four million into eight, less than eight, a little bit less. versus middle pair. I know enough to know middle pair is in trouble. <laughs> but middle pair makes the call. Middle pair. Yeah, this is just classic heads up. You know, uh, one person races, the other person calls. See flop, the person out of position checks, the in position player bets, and then uh, you decide if you have good enough equity to continue. And uh, so far, that's been the case. <laughs> yeah. A lot, a lot of uh, top and middle pair uh, confrontations. Yeah. I guess this, this is the edited version. I forgot. Yeah, yeah it <laughs> is. It's been very action-packed heads up. Oh, yeah. Even we haven't made any monsters or, or setups or anything. It's been pretty uh, pretty standard so far, I would say. Nothing I mean, up. that's one of the things people always forget when they watch live poker is that it takes a lot of hands for the highlight package to be interesting to compile yeah. you know only the best hands from that match so you know when we watch the money maker final table or actually the, the hashim one is a good example they played till uh till almost seven in the morning and they started at 2 p.m and it was a, they, they played straight through but when you watch cool. the broadcast it's only 45 minutes so like <laughs> you yeah the attention span back then was a lot uh, less than it is today yeah, so you know, it goes to show that people are like, "Oh my God, poker was way more exciting back in the day." Like, no, that's because you didn't get to see, you get, didn't get to see any of it. That's the big difference. Yeah, but I really love how the games evolved, and you know, you can see a clear difference in, in skill sets, like uh, the in the player pool and the way people approach the game today, as opposed to 10, 15 years ago. And um, yeah, it's it's been fun, you know, being in this generation of, of watching poker really <laughs> take a massive leap of what it was you know, 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, it's a massive difference. And you played your first main event in 2008 and then you win the main event in 2014 and now we're in 2020. Like those are three different eras. Yeah, completely, man. It's, it's pretty nuts to think about it. How with your, your skill now going back even one or two years i mean i'm assuming you're still working on your game um the the edge you would have over everyone else even going back a few years would just be insane right yeah maybe not one or two years but yeah like five years for sure you could see it uh, but it's it's not just me man like everyone like everyone's so good today that it's it's crazy like it's like a snowball effect you know the better once some uh, group of players get better there's always going to be that rippling effect. Like there's more tools available that made those players better in, in the first place. And then more and more are going to get on the, on the bandwagon and, and want to see, see that. And to me, especially like after I won, I was, um, I was struggling a little bit with motivation because like, I didn't, you know, people say, oh yeah, it was the best performance ever, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, that was, that was great. But like, 
I didn't really didn't know how to take my game to the next level after that. So I like sort of became uh, a bit demotivated too, because like to me it was just like a grind at that point after that. And I kind of lost a little bit of purpose. Interesting hand here. Let's uh, let's watch. He re-raises Stevenson all in. There is the call, but Stevenson is not going to like what he sees. Well, those hands played themselves. Nothing Stevenson could do but get lucky now. Martin Jacobson set up to claim this championship right now. To his credit, Scott Seaver still coaching here in case we continue. The combatants can only now wait for the dealer. And here is the flop. A 10 in the window. Jacobson with the set. Stevenson all but cooked. Yeah, only running nines or running aces will keep Martin Jacobson away from the main event title now. Good game, man. Well played. Good job. Come on, what is the sweat? Yeah. 89. Ah, that's pretty well. Hey, say anything, man. Alright, so you're buying dinner now. <laughs> Not over, yeah. <laughs> he mentions the uh, dinner prop. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> the card. Jacobson poised to take the cash. It's a king. It's over. <laughs> Martin Jacobson completes his masterpiece to become the 2014 World Champion. Pocket tens deliver ten million dollars for Martin Jacobson. Wow. He made this night his own, making nearly every right decision on his. What a, what a moment! Uh, what an incredible rail, as you said as well. You know the rail jumping on you. What does it do to you to see this again? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's quite quite incredible. Like. Uh, Obviously, I don't remember that much from this exact moment. Like, it was such an overwhelming moment. But at the same time, obviously, it's like one of the best moments in my life. Uh, having all my friends there and my family and being able to celebrate with them. And, uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Let's see if you have any words here. I've been close uh, a lot of times. Uh, so, <laughs> but I felt like all those close shots was leading up to this moment. So. I have a really good feeling like, coming in. I think I'm in shock. <laughs> I'm not really feeling anything right now. I just feel super weird. <laughs> On poker's biggest stage. In shock, that's the words you used. Uh, was that an accurate way to describe it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, even though I probably don't look shocked, I look like just like <laughs> every day, you know, uh, like pretty emotionless, but uh, I don't know. It's such a weird transition, you know, going from being so focused on playing your best, shutting out all that emotion for such a long time, just focusing on the on playing your best, and then all of a sudden it's over, and uh, there's no reason to to be focused anymore. Now you're just supposed to uh, sort of all the emotions and be happy, and like, and you are happy, but at the same time, it's like uh, I don't know. I never got that moment, that switch where it's just like all the release. Uh, um, all the pressure just drops and I'm able to enjoy it fully, I think. But, um, you know, great memories with my friends after and like those, you know, that's what I remember the most and like the, the happiest memories. So, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, for the people who are watching this, don't go anywhere. I got a few questions left here for Martin as we see him hoisting that enormous uh, bracelet. A uh, good thing you went to the gym in the months prior because that thing looks really, really heavy. Uh, for the people who are watching the show, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. We got a few questions left on the aftermath of winning the main event and $10 million with that. So you're saying, you know, the greatest, some of the greatest memories are, you know, of that celebration. Um, you know, describe to me, like what moments stand out from uh, celebrating a $10 million win? Um, <laughs> so when you win or when you won at least uh, that year the WSOP uh, gives you the suite at the Rio and it's uh, it's actually like the nicest <laughs> it's hard to believe that you're in the Rio when you see it because it's seven bedrooms you know, it has a fireplace, a bar wow. uh, 
uh, yeah, it's a it's a pretty nice uh, suite. So I managed to you know get all my rail, my friends, my family, everyone that was supporting me there, and we could just have the after party there. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just just a great time, like having everyone together in Vegas, like in November. Like I'm never in Vegas in November. Like it was such a weird feeling and like my family's never been to vegas like they're all there at the rio like like what is going on i just won the main event <laughs> looking back like from my first experience when i went to vegas by myself uh when i was 20 years old because i didn't know anyone and i, I wanted a, a satellite and i decided to go by myself I, I busted the third hand in the main event i was arguably <laughs> the first person out of the tournament and now here i am um only six years later, winning the whole thing. Like, it's such a weird, uh, incredible feeling. And it was like hard to wrap my head around everything that was going on. Uh, but yeah, great time. And then we went to the casino and like, <laughs> yeah, played some craps till like five o'clock in the morning. I had $100 in my pocket and like somehow ran it up to like 15 grand. And I was just, couldn't lose that night. It was, it, yeah, amazing. Like we had so much fun. That's awesome. Um, one anecdote that Mike Watson told me is that uh, Dan Heimiller, who was very, very drunk, <laughs> thought that he was you. Uh, that was probably my favorite moment of the day. <laughs> we had a 15-minute conversation with Watson, like how he could, how he should have played, <laughs> or uh, how well he played, or whatever he said. And then after 15 minutes, like Watson couldn't break it to him, but like, oh, it's actually, I'm actually on Marty Jacobs. <laughs> 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 Man, Dan Heimiller, ultimate legend. He thought for 15 minutes that um, Martin, that, that Mike Watson was Martin Jacobson. I can see it. I can see the resemblance. I mean, if I was, he really was chatting up my mom, and he was tweeting to his, <laughs> he was sending out the public tweets like, "Come to the after party at the suite." <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was funny. Oh man, that, that's really funny. I mean, if if I'm really drunk, I could totally see that happening as well. Uh, difference there between uh, <laughs> you and uh, Sir Watts. Um, but how has becoming the, the main event champion, you know, long-term changed your life and changed your place in the poker world. I don't know if it's changed my place in the poker world or even my life that much. Uh, it's given me some opportunities uh, and you, know, you get some recognition, you get invited to some charity events and, and like that sort of stuff. And that's always fun. Uh, I probably like met a few people that like, these things kind of have like a snowballing effect. So, you know, I'll, I'll do an interview with you. And then the next thing I know, like someone who's seen this interview is contacting me and like, Hey, I saw it when you were talking about this or that. And that's like kind of how uh, a lot of these things go. And then one thing leads to another and you get connected with that person. And yeah. Uh, so I would say that's probably the only way like my life's really changed. Uh, other than that, I'm just trying to, you know, stay humble and be the same person as I was before. And uh, yeah, embrace this memory that I will always have and uh, always be proud of. And uh, just, uh, yeah, stay uh, stay alert too of like to what the future holds, like how excited I am I about poker. Because that's been a, a bit of a roller coaster as I was hinting on. Like the post, uh, the post win uh, scenario, it's like um, once you reach the you know the pinnacle of the of the sport of the game, it's it's hard to beat that. So like, what are you what are you playing for? If you're not playing for money, if you're not playing for fame, like what are you? So it took me a while to get over that, and also I felt like I was kind of staggering in my game development. Like I wasn't improving as much. And when you don't improve, uh, poker isn't that much fun because you wanna you wanna try new things. You wanna like study and and uh, explore new uh, new strategies and implement these strategies in, in real games and uh, yeah hopefully have good results and that's what's exciting you know trying to outsmart your opponents and, and come up with new strategies uh so it took me a while to get get over that hump and right like right now i'm uh i'm really really motivated to continue playing poker for as long as the game exists you know like technology and, and solvers and whatnot is catching up pretty quickly. So who knows how many more years we had. So I'm just trying to enjoy it for now and, and you know, improve my game as much as possible and stay competitive and, and have fun.
at the tables in the year after winning when you're the reigning champion for a whole year um what's it like to walk into a poker room or to sit on a table and and does that sort of wear off you know the further you get removed from being the champion yeah it definitely does uh but it was quite fun the first uh, first year i would say uh you know to people that i didn't expect would come up to me and not like, congratulate me and they you could see that they were genuinely happy for me winning because I was sort of the first, I guess, like long-term grinder pro that won it in, in a very long time or maybe ever. Uh, I guess Merson was quite accomplished, but he was more like on the cash game circuit. And I've been playing tournaments, you know, like people I've played EPTs with for like years were coming up to me and like, oh, I'm so happy for you, man. Like, yeah, uh, like the hard work paid off. And like, that was really good. And, and uh, nice to see and then you know you get some funny comments from like recreationals uh some guy like a lot of people ask me like how i still stay motivated so i had to justify why i was at their 1k table playing <laughs> with them you know because i didn't like jump up in stakes like play you know 100ks or, or only 10ks and above like i still played my stakes uh, or the stakes i've been playing even before for all those years so uh i had to justify why i was there competing with them and and that was uh, like a bit annoying <laughs> at times but i think it was annoying because i was every time i got asked that question i had to justify it myself like what am i am i doing this because i still love it like i, do I really love this environment i'm in right now and what i'm doing or am i just doing it because it's what i've been doing for so long and like well, what are my other options if you don't have anything else to rely on and make uh not just an income but like I was fine financially, like if, you know, I may uh, invest it wisely, like I can live a pretty good life after it. But uh, that's never been my style. Like uh, I'm always like sh uh, challenge and uh, chasing the next challenge. Uh, but when you don't have a, a clear path of what you want to do, then it can be a bit difficult. And it's easy to get stuck in a pattern that maybe you should leave. So right now in this moment, 2020, of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but still, um, is your focus, even though you can only really play online right now, is your focus on, you know, playing high stakes and higher stakes live, or are you really enjoying the online grind? And how do you sort of look at yourself whenever this might be when, when live poker really returns as still, you know, a traveling circuit player? Well, it depends how, um, what the future of poker holds. I'm, I've never set long-term goals in poker because it's so uh, uh, it's so uh, unreliable. And like it's really hard to predict what what's going to happen. Um, so I try to only plan like a few months in advance. Obviously, like you say, we're in the pandemic now, so who knows when live poker will be back. But over the years, I've had a pretty good mix. I would say you know, like 50-50 online and live, and I, I appreciate both both aspects and I wouldn't want to just do one for uh, forever <laughs> you know when I, whenever I play live for a long time it's so nice to be able to you know sit in your home environment by yourself and having tons of tables your action your whatever uh, eating your food like it's just so much more convenient uh then when you're in a casino environment or in a conference room somewhere and you're packed in squeezed in by eight other players and you know long days and you got to travel there and whatnot but i also love that social aspect of poker and like that's when i spend time with my friends so i wouldn't definitely wouldn't want to only play online poker which i'm kind of forced in right now uh, but I mean, right now we don't have an option, so I'm just trying to appreciate it for, for what it is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me here on the show. For everyone watching, this show is happening twice a week. It's on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is a perfect time for the Europeans to watch because it's 7 p.m. Central European time. And then Thursday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, which is 8 p.m. Central European time. And then you should already be in bed if you live in Europe because that's in the middle of the night. Um, lots of great guests to pick from. If you love this show, you will love the other ones as well. I've had Moneymaker, Hashem, Raymer on the show already with plenty more guests coming up, including, you know, a lot more main event winners because those stories are always incredible to tell. Martin, thanks once again for releasing this with me and thank you for waiting until i asked you to finally watch your main event final table 
Thanks, man. It's been fun. All right, awesome. I'll catch you guys on the next show. This was Run It Back.